All right. Uh, with, with that, without delay, I would like to call on Dr. Nagori to give us the first, uh, you know, the, the first insight into today. The theme for which is IUI secrets unveiled. So I'm, 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 I'm sure that all of us are waiting for Dr. Uh, Dr. Nagori to speak. Dr. Nagori, the stage is yours. We welcome you. A big round of applause for Dr. Nagori as he comes on. Respected Dr. Asar, all the CEOs and dignitaries of the Garbhagudi organization, Mr. Satish and his team, I am extremely thankful and highly obliged for presenting my work here. I will be discussing how do I optimize my IUI results. Uh, I think at the end of the lecture we can discuss if you want to clarify certain things more in detail or you may not agree to certain things and I would like to tell you my opinion why I stick to these things. IUI is probably the least optimized in fertility management. Whenever I go to any forum, uh, in one of an IVF forum I discussed this at length that those who are doing a regular gynec practice have not a good setup of an IUI and that's why they don't get the result. And those who are having an IVF center very well established are probably not interested in doing an IUI. And that's why IUI is a no man's land and much importance is not given to IUI and either the patient uh, is not treated properly or immediately taken for IVF. What I want to emphasize, because majority of the patients, they come to me and tell that I've got undergone five IUI, I've gone undergone 10 IUIs, and I've not got the result. Or you do two to three IUIs, and then the patient is subjected for IVF. I always emphasize that it is not an IUI that gives you a pregnancy. IUI is simply a one plate in the whole dish. Everything has to be in the plate, then and then you can relish the food. You cannot relish only a one item. And for that, your indication, stimulation, monitoring protocol, triggering, cement processing, insemination, luteal support, then you get a pregnancy. Everything has to fit very well. Then and then you get the prize in the puzzle. So that is how everything has to be in order. Then and then you get the pregnancy. A steps of IUI should be indication, stimulation, monitoring, timing, cement preparations, and IUI. If you just miss a single step, if you do not properly go for that step, you just fell down and you don't get a result. That's why in an IUI, each and every step is extremely important rather than only IUI. Commonest indication in our clinical practice, unexplained infertility, disovulatory infertility, male subfertility, mild to moderate endometriosis. These are the common indications of uh, IUI. Why I want to establish this thing Unexplained infertility is an indication of an IUI and not an indication of IVF. I've got 125 patients who have conceived with an IUI, out of which 70% were of idiopathic infertility after three IVF failure. My ultimate carry-on message is that unexplained infertility is not an indication of IVF. If you go to the literature, if you see the indications of IVF, the unexplained infertility is the last. First is the tubal block, second is the very low count, third is ovum donation, fourth is third and fourth degree endometriosis, and unexplained infertility comes as a last. But unfortunately, it is now put and shifted to a first level or second level for doing an IVF practice. So you do a correct IUI because the fault here, you don't know. It, that's why it is unexplained infertility. And try to establish everything in a proper order, you will get the result. Monthly chance of pregnancy is 1 to 2 percent and while that with the superovulation with IUI is almost 10 to 15 percent. So one is unexplained infertility, second is disovulatory infertility. Absolute pregnancy rate is higher with multifollicular as compared to the monofollicular growth. So disovulatory infertility is also an indication of an IUI. I give you one of the example that good number of patients of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism are taken for IVF. Because you are afraid of OHSS, you are afraid of number of follicles which develop more, 
But if you stimulate it very well, I've got plenty of patients who have just conceived with an IUI or either with a good ovulation, just get it ruptured and uh, the pregnancy can ha occur. So these are the patients, that's why it is very important to decide where is the fault and for that, which is the treatment available to that patient. Here, the problem is with the ovulation. Correct the ovulation, the patient should get a result. So you correct the ovulate, disovulatory infertility and you can get the result. When the motile sperm count before sperm preparation is less than 10 million, it is called the mild male factors of fertility. And mild ovarian hyperstimulation with intra uterine insemination is done in all these cases. What I want to emphasize is that nowadays, if you read the literature, the research of improving the count by medical management has completely stopped Companies have not financed a single rupee for the, develop, for the research of the drugs for improvement of the count after the invention of an IVF. That's a very sad story, I would say. That now no research, no funding is done in the Western countries for the drugs which can improve the count. Why? Because IVF treatment is totally financed by the government. Here it is not so. Here the patient has to spend from her pocket. So what is important is that try to improve the count and change an ICSI cycle into an IVF cycle, IVF cycle into an IUI cycle, and IUI cycle into a natural conception. But we rarely pay attention to improve the count. I, you, you believe me, my majority of the practice, almost 50% is of male infertility, and we improve lots of patients the count and can convert to a lower category which is less costly to the patient. If you go to the lower level from ICSI to IVF, IVF to IUI, IUI to natural conception, the cost to the patient will be low and the pregnancy rates are always high with the lower technology rather than with higher technology. So improve the count and challenge and change the IVF cycle into an uh, IVF cycle into an IUI cycle. A very eye-opener. I don't say that this is my success. I have not put that this case for that. But is, it is an eye-opener that what should be done to a patient. This was an industrialist, hyponate industries, which are very well known in India and very well known in Gujarat. Uh, nine years infertility, semen count three million, seven IVF ICSI failures, husband treated medically, count increased to 22 million and conceived IUI the third cycle and spontaneous conception after two and a half years and delivered a second baby boy. See, it is an eye opener that don't try to sail in the same boat. This patient had come to me for an IVF or ICSI, obviously. But I cannot do any magic. I don't want to emphasize that my colleagues have done anything wrong. They tried their level best, but the patient did not conceive. So I should not sail in the same boat. I should try to think an alternative management. Remember, whenever the patient comes to you, try to think an alternative management or what your colleagues have failed rather than what they have done. And if you try to find out these things, you can get definitely good success in good number of patients. This was the patient which was treated medically. Itself is a very big lecture, one, one hour lecture of how to improve the count. But uh, Professor Ishidori has given one regime that he was from Sweden and in 1992 I think he gave the regime that there is something like bioactivity and something like immunoactivity. Whatever we measure the blood levels of FSH, LA, testosterone, whatever it is, these are immunological level. They are not the biological level. And immunoactivity is not equivalent to bioactivity. Uh, have FSH in one person in both the persons may be normal, but the bioactive is different in both the persons. And these are the some of the group of the patients where bioactivity is poor, and that is one of the reason of less production of spermatozoa. So this patient was treated with Isidoris regime, that is uh, HMG thrice a week and HCG once a week. This was given for 13 weeks. The count improved, for spontia, the patient conceived with the third cycle, and after two and a half years, but the count had already crossed 15 million count, and that's why spontaneous conception is possible, and this patient conceived. So what I, my carry home message is that you try to improve the count. Don't, don't go straight away for the higher technology. You can give some time, and majority of the patients cannot afford IVF for repeated cycles. They may afford for one cycle, but the majority cannot afford for repeated cycles. And these are the patients where, and all of us know very well that good number of patients conceive after stopping the treatment. And these are the examples that if you try to improve the count, they can have a conception. 
mild to moderate endometriosis, always treat them and consider an IUI cycles with them. All of you know that endometric implants activate the local immune response and cause release of the bioactive mediators, including free radicals, cytokines, and growth factors followed by inflammation. That is why whenever you do an endoscopy, whenever you get the endometriotic spots or lesions, always fulgurate it, always treat it, because that definitely improves the pregnancy rate. Literature says that up to mild uh, endometriosis, the pregnancy rates are same, but you have already put a scope and there is no harm in treating the mild to moderate endometriosis when you have already put the scope. Less common indications, cervical osteolytic, immunological, HIV positive male, single tube, ejaculatory failure, failed AID and frozen samples when the husband is out or husband is on chemotherapy. Now, cervical factor is not seen nowadays, uh, even though it is mentioned in the literature, but very rarely we see because uh, frequent DNCs are always to be avoided and cauterization of cervix. I would put it only one line that the cautery should be thrown out from your clinic. post test is very useful in infertility management. If you read any IVF or uh, ART textbooks, they say that the post test has got no role because you are straightway doing an IVF. But if you read the insular, uh, he has mentioned in a one line only that positive post test is directly related to the pregnancy rate. No other thing. Positive post test is directly related to the uh, pregnancy rate. So, by WHO standard, 10 to 12 spermatozoa per high power field, if you see after 10 to 12 hours of an intercourse, that indicates cervical mucus is very good. It means the hormone milieu is normal, uh, uh, estrogen level is normal. When estrogen is normal, LH peak is going to occur. When LH peak is going to occur, follicle is going to rupture. So, so many things you can understand by simply doing a post test. Uh, and there is no need to evaluate male further if your post test is very good. Immunological, there is no role of steroids, absolutely no role, only IUI, because the pregnancy rates are zero uh, with the steroid group. Immunological infertility, IUI is the first choice, and if the patient does not conceive, go for IVF and XC. HIV positive male and HIV negative female, there are more than 3,000 couples who were treated and there was no zero conversion, so that's why IUI is a treatment of choice. Uh, single tube, preferably you must do an IUI where the tube is patent. Why? Because if you understand the physiology, when the ovary is there, when the follicle is very well developed, the tube covers the fimbria ovarica contracts and the tube covers the whole ovary and the columnar epithelium starts, the cilia starts moving, causing a minus one negative mil millimeter of pressure, and this minus one millimeter negative pressure extracts the ova, the wall ruptures, and the follicle enters the tube. So it's not of, it is not the ova which goes inside the tube, it is the tube which catches an ova. This is the difference, and that is why tubo-ovarian relations are, should be normal before performing an IUI. And that's why still I condemn HCG, uh, HSG. I always do, for my IUI, I always do the laparoscopy, try to evaluate the tubo-ovarian relations, and if that is normal, you should perform an IUI. Now, uh, apart from the indications, now we go how to stimulate the patients for the IUI. That is, we have got clomiphene citrate, gonadotrophins, and we have got the combination. Clomiphene citrate, day 5 to 9, but the cycle fecundability in a spontaneous and a CC-induced cycle is the same as compared to gonadotrophin. And despite being more expansive, existing treatments such as empirical CC and unstimulated IUI do not offer superior birth rates compared with the expected management of unexplained infertility. A UK randomized control trial compared the effectiveness of CC and IUI and that with an expectant management and concluded that neither showed superior live birth rates compared with the expectant management. So what I want to conclude that if you want to do an IUI, CC is out of question. Superovulation with IUI has got the higher pregnancy rates than after time intercourse and clomiphene citrate. 
there are some centers like Van Hollem, they offer without stimulation and IUI, but the pregnancy rate are extremely low, 2 to 8 percent per cycle, but it is always lower than the stimulated cycle. As a stimulated cycles have the higher multiple pregnancy rates, many centers, including the Van Hall Clinic London, offers natural cycle IUI in couples with the cervical factor subfertility. IUI in the natural cycles significantly increases the probability of conception. But if you compare the superovulation with IUI, the pregnancy rates are always very high, and that's why. Uh, unstimulated cycle IUI gives you hardly 2 to 3 percent pregnancy rate and jets should be discouraged. Advantages of superovulation increase the number of oocytes, more oocytes, more chances of conception. Increased steroid may improve the chances of fertilization and implantation. Subtle hormonal deficiencies are corrected. LPD is corrected. I don't mean uh, superovulation means multiple follicles on both the sides. I'm coming to that point. Increased fertilization window as the several oocytes are released over a protracted period. The effect of ovulation induction and IUI on pregnancy appears to be independent and additive. So only IUI does not give you a pregnancy, super ovulation plus IUI, that adds the pregnancy. IUI uh, is more cost effective than IVF in cases of male factor or unexplained infertility. Uh, gonadotropin with IUI has 10 to 15 percent chances of pregnancy as compared to 1 to 2 percent with a natural cycle in idiopathic infertility. And the pregnancy rates are far better when IUI is combined with gonadotropin as compared to IUI is combined with the natural cycle CC or CC plus HMG. Now the question is always when you are stimulating. So my carry on message second is that you always stimulate with the gonadotropin for an IUI cycle. Uh, to get an excellent pregnancy rate. Now the question is which gonadotropin is to be used because every three months some company comes with the gonadotropin and everyone says that my gonadotropins are the best. How you should judge that which is the product that you should use for it? If you just see the specific bioactivity, the HMG bioactivity is eight international unit. If you see urinary FSH then it is 100 to 150 international unit. Urinary HMG highly purified, it is 2,000 international unit. Urinary FSH, which is highly purified, that is 9,000 international unit. And recombinant FSH, 10,000 international unit. So more or less highly purified FSH and highly or recombinant FSH are going almost parallel. Uh, recombinant is the best, but step one step lower down if you want to use, you can use than highly purified FSH, which has got 9,000 international uh, activity, uh, specific bioactivity. What is the difference? I tell you my, I share my experience that if you are using an HP product and if you are using a recombinant product, the dose required is almost double with urinary product. So if you are using 75 international unit of recombinant FSH, then you have to use almost 150 of urinary. And then if you compare the price, almost it is the same. So whenever you want to use the urinary product, always increase the dose to the double level, while for the recombinant you can go to up to 50% of a urinary level. Meta-analysis of randomized control trials. Meta-analysis of randomized control trials comparing FSH with HMG is always in favor of FSH. FSH is preferred to HMG because most of the women undergoing IUI ovulate normally and thus have the normal endogenous LH level. This point I want to emphasize that if you want to do an IUI without down regulation or then always go for FSH because LH is already present. You have not down regulated the patient and that is why LH is always present. And that's why don't add more LH because you don't know what is the ceiling effect of an LH which will decrease the quality of the follicle, will, will, which will decrease the growth of the follicle. And that is why by and the thing which is not required in the body, why we should add it. And that is why always stick to only FSH, particularly when you have not down-regulated the patient. I already told you that the bioactivity and immunoactivity are different during the du de menstrual cycle. If you see the menstrual cycle in the first five days, the bioactivity is extremely poor and the amount secreted of FSH is always more. But if you go to the periovulatory period, the bioactivity is highest and the amount of secretion of FSH is less. So 
the recombinant FSH is prepared from a Chinese larva in such a way that it mimics the periovulatory FSH. And that is why the dose required is always less and that is why the bioactivity is very good. While the urinary FSH which is taken from a menopausal urine is having the least bioactivity. Witty. It is like a weeping a tired horse, the FSH is secreted in a woman. And that's why you cannot expect to a certain level of a bioactivity uh, more than certain level. While here in a recombinant, and that is why you have to increase the dose if you want to get the same bioactivity. And here you have to decrease the dose to get the same bioactivity. So that's why you have to decide which drug to be used, but this is a fa famous Salim Dyer slide that favors the recombinant FSH as compared to urinary FSH uh, uh, in his meta-analysis. I don't go to the further. And if you consider the, in an IVF cycle, if you consider the freezing, uh, freezing uh, results along with the freezing embryos, then these are always higher with the recombinant FSH. Now, how will you stimulate in an IUI? Stimulation protocol, the decision about the stimulation protocol is based on the ultrasound finding on a baseline scan. I'm sure Mamta is going to discuss this topic. I don't go into much detail because she's going to talk on ovarian reserve. So that's why she'll be taking a baseline scan uh, along with this. But what I want to emphasize that uh, those who are having a color Doppler and those who are having 3D power Doppler accordingly, you can have these uh, uh, parameters and can decide whether you should go to a step down protocol or whether you should go for a chronic dose, low dose protocol or with the same protocol. So your baseline scan is extremely important. It should not be that all of a sudden you get multiple follicles on both the sides. It means your baseline scan was wrong, your stimulation protocol was wrong. And that is why the baseline scan will tell you whether it is a normal ovary, whether it is PCO, whether it is low reserve ovary, or whether it is poor responding ovary. And according to that ovary, you would stimulate the, you would stimulate the your IUI or an IVF cycle. And that is why there are different protocols. One is a conventional protocol. In an IUI cycle, if you want to start gonadotropin, start from day five give it 75 international unit for five days, then do a scan. If endometrium is growing, continue the same dose. If the follicle is also growing, continue the same dose. Neither is growing, then you increase the dose to two ampules. Give it for three days, and on the fourth day, again do a scan, and then either you continue the same dose or you increase the dose. Those were the days when we used to start with one ampule and we have reached to four ampules. But at that time, we had not the sophisticated ultrasound machines, and perhaps our knowledge regarding the baseline scan was also not, not good. So we have given up to four, four ampules. Now, instead of that, if we know that it is a poor responding ovary, we will start from two or three ampules from very first day. This protocol has been blamed for the higher rates of multiple pregnancy in an ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, but I personally do not agree. With the statement of high risk of OHSS as step up is never used in PCO patients. See, all the hyperstimulation which have occurred by stepping up a dose are the PCO patients. If it is a normal ovary, then you can increase the dose after the five days, there won't be any problem. Step down protocol, these are the patients which are the poor responders, where you start the dose with a higher level. And you start with two ampules, you start with three ampules, and once you get a follicle of about 10 to 12 millimeter, decrease the dose, which is a more of a, just like a physiological thing, that in a normal patient, that the dose is, uh, the FSH is on the higher side, and that come, then you give a lower dose. Here also, you decrease the dose, try to get two or three follicles, and then you can treat the patient. Very, very important is a chronic low dose protocol. All PGO, so remember one thing, that even in an IVF, the pregnancy rates are very poor in IVF patients. Number of follicles, when they increase, the pregnancy rate decreases. It's a, when we, we believe that PCO must be having a good number of follicles and that's why results are good. It is other way around. The results are poor in a PCO patients and they are very good in a normal responding ovaries. So whenever you do an, in an IUI, the stimulating protocol, start with 75 or even up to 37.5, and you should have courage not to increase the dose up to 14 days. This is a very important statement, that you should have courage not to increase the dose up to 14 days in a PCO patient. 
So by 14 days you will develop, uh, you will get a follicle. If you don't get a follicle, increase the dose up to only 50 percent. And believe me, within seven days you will always get a follicle. But you will get only one or two or three follicles. You will never get five, seven, five, seven follicles on both the sides. Because more the number of follicles, more the follicle ruptures, more estrogen progesterone, detrimental for implantation. And that is why the pregnancy rates are very poor in PCO. And that's why you should have one or two or three follicles in PCO. The results are excellent. So try to get less number of patients by chronic low dose protocol. The OHS is extremely low. Multiple pregnancy is also extremely low when you go with the low dose protocol. Almost all the patients develop good follicle and endometrium and incidence of multiple pregnancy and OHSS is extremely low. Uh, this is not for you. So if you see that gonadotropin plus IUI has got always the higher pregnancy rate. Now 10% of the couple will become pregnant in each cycle. And believe me, this is the data when no color Doppler was used. This is the data when no 3D power Doppler was used. So 60% in six cycle is otherwise a pregnancy rate with an IUI without having a sophisticated gadgets. Now we will go that how we can improve still this result. And you can reach up to 85 to 90% in an idiopathic or, or disovulatory infertility patients with 85 to 90% results in six cycles. Uh, unfortunately, I will put it that the letrozole has been withdrawn from the market. Otherwise, excellent drug. Uh, a word of caution that don't combine, I've written correctly in my book, that don't combine CC and gonadotropin. The reason is that the clomiphene stimulates FSH and LH. This acts on the ovary, estrogen is secreted. Estrogen go back to the hypothalamus, but the receptors are occupied by the clomiphene. That is why the level of estrogen is not perceived and that is why the hypothalamus and pituitary goes on throwing FSH and LH. So the LH level is high when you use CC. And if you use gonadotropin, the lower pregnancy rate in CC is because of the high LH. So by adding gonadotropin, you are not improving the hormonal milieu. And that is why pregnancy rates are very poor. Believe me, never I have never used CC plus HMG combination because it does not improve the pregnancy rate and increases the cost to the patient. But when the letrozole was available, when letrozole stimulates the hypothalamus, uh, FSH and LH, both are secreted, and this will cause high estrogen level. This estrogen will go to the hypothalamus and pituitary, where the receptors are not blocked. And that is why the FSH and LH will decrease. So that is why the LH level is not high when you use a letrozole. The LH level is high when you use clomiphene citrate. And that's why letrozole can be combined with gonadotropin. CC cannot be combined with gonadotropin. And I had an excellent result because I had almost never used clomiphene citrate when the letrozole was available to me, all the patients. And we got an excellent pregnancy rate with the lower cost to the patient. Adding GNRH antagonist in the cycle with the mild ovarian hyperstimulation in an IUI program does not increase the live birth rate in general population. So at randomly don't use antagonist to get a good result. Uh, we, we give normally antagonist when the size of the follicle is 14 millimeter, but that will drastically reduce the LH. And LH is necessary for the final maturation and final, the final stages of the development of an ova. And you must have found that in good number of patients by adding antagonists, the follicle decreases and your cycle is cancelled. So, which are the patients where you should add an antagonist? Classical PCO patients where the premature LH surge is very common, tonically LH is at a higher level, these are the cases where you should an antagonist. And typical patient is a thin, lean PCO patient. Your baseline scan will tell 
that this is a PCO and thin lean PCO patients, the LH level is always high. These are the cases where you add antagonist and you get a good pregnancy. One of my first patient who conceived with antagonist when it came in the market, that this was a patient, eight years infertility, 24 IUIs and two IVF were done on this patient. So try to find out that what has been missed by your colleague. And this was the case, typical thin, lean PCO patients where we added antagonists. It was absolutely new in the market at that time. The patient conceived with the third cycle and delivered a twin pregnancy. So that is why a correct stimulating protocol and a correct usage of the drug is very useful apart from IUI. Now you have stimulated the cycle you have find out what is the best indication, you have stimulated the patient, now you have to monitor the patient very well. And how to do a monitoring? Believe me that ultrasound monitoring is the key of the success of your IUI pregnancies. It is something like Arjun Nuband, Bheem Ki Gadathi, Usi Tara Gynecologist Ka Ultrasound. Infertility specialists have to master their ultrasound. If they master their ultrasound, then they can get an excellent pregnancy rate. Uh, correct time for ovulation trigger can be decided by ascertaining the functional maturity of the follicle and ascertaining the optimal endometrial receptivity. And this can be achieved by correlating the ultrasound findings with the physiology and hormonal changes of a menstrual cycle. A Doppler is always done before the HCG. Uh, one drastic statement that infertility practice cannot be done without a color Doppler. So those who are not having color do Doppler and only a 2D ultrasound machine and want to do a good infertility practice should immediately switch over to color Doppler and then later on the good machines. Uh, perifollicular color Doppler, the vascularity should be, see we always tell that follicle should be 18 millimeter and the triple line endometrium, that is not enough. What you see in anatomical maturity, by measuring the dimension is an anatomical maturity and when you put it on a color Doppler, it tells you the functional maturity. So just by looking at an anatomy, you cannot say the functional status of that person, same way. Here, by looking at a follicle which is anatomically mature, cannot be functionally mature. So that's why you see the vascularity that should cover the three-fourth of the follicle and resistant index, that is RI should be between 0.4 to 0.48 and PSV should be more than 10, where the LH surge starts. So these are the minimum requirement for a good follicle and then and then the HCG is given to the patient. If you give HCG earlier, then also it is not going to be useful. If you give it later, then also it is not going to be useful. So follicular RI and PSV are more important in decision making than the size of the follicle. And I give you for one of my first patients who conceived when I had a color Doppler in 2000. The first patient who had failed with two cycles where the size was 18, but you can see that RI was 0.64. It was, it should be between 0.4 to 0.5. And we are always afraid that this follicle will rupture, but it never ruptures because it is not functionally mature. And even if it ruptures, it is not going to give you the pregnancy. That's not a good follicle. So we waited for three days when the RI went between 0.4 to 0.5 and we gave HCG and then did an IUI, this patient conceived. What I want to emphasize, that the same patient did not conceive when we used to give an 18 millimeter triple line endometrium and did an IUI, the patient did not conceive. But we could find out that the functionally the follicle was not mature and that's why the patient was not conceiving. This was, so that is how your color Doppler can help you exactly the timing of HCG and that can improve your pregnancy rate. A rising PSV with the steady low RI suggests that the follicle is closer to the rupture and oocytes from severely hypoxic follicles are associated with high frequency of abnormalities of organization of chromosomes on metaphase spindle and may lead to segregation disorders and catastrophic mosaic in embryo. So you are, if, uh, if the PSV is less, if the uh, vascularization is not proper, then the follicle will be hypoxic. Either you will get a chromosomally abnormal baby or the abortion rates are very high with this. Therefore, a fertilization of a follicle with a PSV of less than 10 centimeter per second have a high chances of developing an embryo with chromosomal abnormality and abortion. 
a marked increase in syst peak systolic velocity around the follicle in the presence of a relatively constant PI could be a sign of a follicle maturity and impending ovulation. Volume assessment of the follicle. See, if you have got a 3D, 3D power Doppler, then you can still go further. Uh, if you have 2D, you go with the anatomical diameters. If you have got color Doppler, you go for PSV of the follicle and RI and vascularity of the follicle. And still, if you have got a higher machine, then you can got a uh, follicular volume, uh, s cumulus, VI, FI, and VFI values. Uh, at many places, I go and people tell that we don't have this machine, what we should do. My answer is that then you should be satisfied with your results. You can't expect the excellent results without doing anything. You have to do something more than what, what you are doing. Then and then you can get an excellent results. Uh, volume of the follicle should be between 3 to 7. And uh, I don't go into the detail how the volume is measured. What is important is that if you have got a 3D ultrasound, you can beautifully see the cumulus ophorus. And the ova which is having a cumulus ophorus is likely to fertilize. Those ova which are not having a cumulus, in almost 90 to 95 percent at present now, you will be able to see the cumulus. And that is why it gives you a good uh, assumption that this patient is likely to conceive when you see the cumulus. Follicles with uniform vascularity, perifollicular vascular network are more likely to produce a pregnancy. So 3D power Doppler can, uh, you can assess the quantitative and qualitative assessment of a vascularity which can be done. Based on this study, we had presented this in 2006 at London, more than 1000 cycles that if the VI is between 6 to 20 and FI is more than 35, the pregnancy rates are very high. So we see color Doppler, when the color Doppler parameters have been met, then we go to VI, FI and VFI values. And then we have found out that if these values are within this range, then the pregnancy rates are very high. Same way for endometrium, thickness should be 7 millimeter or more, preferably 8 to 10 triple line endometrium with grade A or B morphological pattern and vascularity in zone 3 and 4. What is, if you have only 2D ultrasound, you can see that the uh, grade A endometrium, you can see the opacities in between. In the triple line, it is not a sonolucent area. And these are actually the va vessels which have developed, which have penetrated the endometrium, and that is why you can see this ecogenicity. And second is the glycogen deposition in the columnar epithelium gives you this appearance. So this, if you have only 2D ultrasound, that can help you that this is a mature endometrium. While a triple line endometrium with the sonolucent area in between, even though excellent triple line is not a mature endometrium, it will not help in the implantation. Then subendometrial, absent subendometrial and the intraendometrial vascularization on the day of HCG appears to be a useful predictor of failure of implantation in IVF irrespective of the morphological appearance. So irrespective of morphological appearance, the vascularity has to be there. And when vascularity is in zone 3 and 4, zone 3 means it enters the endometrium and zone 4 means it touches the midline. If this is the vascularity, the implantation will occur. Uh, whatever good follicle there is, but if the vascularity is not in an endometrium, the patient is not likely to conceive. One of the very important things which people forget, and that is the uterine artery PI. Uterine artery PI should be between 2.2 uh, to 3, 3.2 maximum. All embryo transfer should be deferred for the next cycle if the endometrial PI is more than 3. So the implantation does not occur. And that is why even in an IUI cycle, try to see that the, endome the uterine artery PI decreases and then and then you give HCG and do an IUI. This should cover at least 5 millimeter square area of the endometrium. I don't go. This uterine artery PI should be between 2.22 and 3.16. That is mandatory for giving HCG and doing an IUI. It has been shown in several studies that the uterine artery PI more than 3.2 implantation rates are extremely low and embryo transfer or IUI should be withheld.
this is how you measure the endometrial volume and volume should be between 3 to 10 otherwise the pregnancy does not occur these are certain studies of 3d power doppler i don't go into the detail of it but how this 3d power doppler helps you to improve the pregnancy rate so which is the ideal time for giving hcg just i summarize that the follicle should be more than 16 3 fourth vascularity should cover ri should be less than 0.5 psv more than 10 volume between 3 to 8 cc cumulus of forest should be present vi more than 6 fi more than 35 all the things must be seen in each and every patient if you want to improve your success rate and with the practice it hardly takes less than five minutes same way with the endometrium six more than six millimeter grade a endometrium vascularity in zone three and four see you can see this is how and if you add a 3d power doppler parameters you can improve the pregnancy rates triggering of ovulation triggering of ovulation is always with hcg only one indication of gnr channel lock for the ovulation trigger is a pco patients when you get multiple follicles on both the sides when you have not used a chronic low dose protocol when you and come across multiple follicles then use gnrh analog as an ovulation trigger but it causes a luteal phase defect there are good number of patients that in spite of giving luteal support the lpd still remains and that is why the pregnancy rates are poor uh, in an IVF, we routinely use now in all IVF, in all the patients when you use an antagonist protocol in an uh, PCO patients, but then the luteal phase management is different. At the time of ovum pickup, we give 1500 units of HCG uh, and then later on we observe the patient. So these are different things, but otherwise there is no indication for GNRH analog for an ovulation trigger. HCG is still time tested, it does not require a lu judicious luteal support. Timing of IUI, when to do an IUI, conventional timings are 38 hours, but in the literature if you find it is 18, 42, 24, 48, 38 hours and 24 hours later if no rupture in HCG. See all these uh, number of, uh, I mean different protocols are not related to color Doppler, are not related to 3D power Doppler. So what we presented, see, if you see the literature, then the literature says that the double IUI showed no significant benefit over the single IUI in the treatment of soft fertile couples with the husband semen. The Cochrane review always says that the double IUI has got no pregnancy, improved the pregnancy rate. But all these papers have gone through all the literature in the world and nobody has mentioned about color Doppler or 3D power Doppler use for doing a single IUI or for double IUI. And that's why we presented this paper at International Congress at London that whether the double IUI can improve your pregnancy rate and which are the cases where you can you have to do a double IUI. If you see the graph, the PSV of the follicle is 10 centimeter per second when the LHR starts and then reaches to a peak. And the, when the follicle ruptures, it reaches up to as high as 45. So if you do an ultrasound and if you find out that the PSV of the follicle is 20, instead of 36 hours, it is going to rupture earlier. It may rupture earlier. And that is why you require one IUI earlier than your conventional IUI because that IUI will help to give the pregnancy. The ova after the rupture does not survive more than eight to nine hours. And that is why if the follicle has ruptured earlier and nine hours have already passed, your second IUI is not going to benefit from, uh, the only conventional IUI is not going to benefit to you. So these are the cases where the follicles are likely to rupture earlier and that is why you must add one IUI after 12 hours and second after 36 hours. In now we have the second study what we are doing that this is the, uh, you may in some of the cases you can avoid the second IUI, a conventional 36 hour IUI and you can do an IUI after 12 hours only. So the color Doppler precisely tells you exactly when to do an IUI. See, this was the data I would like to present that we, what we had presented, that if you see that when the PSV, peak systolic velocity of a follicle, is more than 20, 
then always the pregnancy rates were very high when the double IUI was done. So we recommend double IUI when the perifollicular PSV on the day of HCG is more than 20 cm per second and the perifollicular RI is within the normal limits. All of you know the latest guidelines are the 15 million normal count with 30% motility with 4% normal morphology is considered as a normal semen analysis. There is always a discussion whether the incubator is required for IUI or for it is not required for an IUI. For a having a good pregnancy rate, you should have a good incubator with you. I have always used SIM speculum, hold the cervix, make, make an alignment of a cervical and the uterine canal and I've done an IUI and it has not changed my result. I've not used, this is my opinion, I don't say that you should carry with this. But this is my opinion that in my more than 8,000 pregnancies, I've always used the SIM speculum and the LSS forceps. Because otherwise, if you use a Cusco in good, more than one third of cases, it will be difficult to negotiate the cannula. You will have a bleeding and you'll have all the trouble for introducing it. So that's why it does not change the uh, pregnancy rate. Inject only 0.3 to 0.7 ml or prepared some ml. Actually, even it is. See, whenever you use more than that, it is normally intratubal insemination along with an intrauterine insemination. And that's why you have to be very slow, otherwise you, you will push the ova also outside the peritoneal cavity. And allow the patient to rest for 15 minutes and luteal support with HCG and progesterone. Sound also should be thrown out from your clinic. There is no role of uterine sound. Always measure the uterus cervical length with the help of the ultrasound and don't touch the fundus and then come back. You must know the uterocervical length should be written, written on the case paper of each and every patient. Just negotiate an internal loss and just put it. Allow the patient to rest for 15 minutes and this is a paper which was also that uh, the resting for 15 minutes increases the pregnancy rate. But there is no need for 30 minutes or one hour or to admit the patient. Maximum six cycles of IUI should be tried and all these six cycles should be with the gonadotropin and ultrasound monitoring. And you can get an excellent pregnancy rates. According to literature, the minimum post was sperm count required for IUI is 2 million with 4% normal spermatozoa. But in our own series, the highest pregnancy rates have been achieved when the post was count which was between 6 to 8 million. Advanced maternal age along with the low AFC and low AMH should be offered the OM donation. Success rate of IUI sharply dec decreases after the 40 years of age of a female partner. So either think of an IVF or think of an OM donation for these patients. Number of cycles, I've told you, six, eight, six to eight million count I've already discussed. Remember one thing that formerly there was an era, I think, in our state that patient is having 86%, 85% abnormal sperms and patients were taken for ICSI. Only 4% normal sperm, 4% normal morphology is required and that is more than 4% is eligible for IUI. There is no need for taking this patient for ICSI. More than 2 million and 4% normal sperm count are eligible for an IUI. This was by John Balach. So for regular IUI, swim up is a very good method and is much cheaper than the density gradient and pregnancy rates is very high with eight to 10 million post was count. That's why it is very important how much count you get rather than what method you are using for the semen wash. So you have to choose the semen wash technique according to the number of spermatozoa you want to inseminate. And accordingly you decide the uh, semen wash technique and you do an IUI. You can have our own modifications for speed of the centrifugation and time of centrifugation according to the count and motility of the sample. Uh, luteal support is always must. All stimulated cycles should be given the luteal support. Uh, this was my analysis of more than 6,000 patients who had conceived with, I don't go into the detail of it, but this, uh, I just summarize it that in my conclusion, the best results are achieved with idiopathic and disovulatory infertility. Better pregnancy rates can be achieved by gonadotrophin stimulation. 
Letrozole plus recombinant aphetase is best protocol so far for all the patients, especially for PCOs. Ultrasound decides the timing of HCG and IUI, and that is the key for the success of IUI. Antagonists can be used in a thin, lean PCO patients to prevent the premature LH surge and detrimental effect of excessive LH on an OVA. HCG has always been better for ovulation trigger than GNRH analog, and HCG is also seen to be very effective for the luteal support either alone or in combination with micronized progesterone as compared to progesterone alone. Achieve an ultimate cohort of 6 to 10 million in the post-wash sample. That will give you an excellent results. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nagori. I'm sure after that uh, thought-provoking and very insightful message that you gave us, there could be some questions arising, so we're good on time. Uh, so we can take about four or five questions. I, I would request uh, the mics to be passed around. And if there are any questions that you, you want to ask, please feel free to do so. Doctor, I take the liberty of uh, okay. saying that you can ask questions. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for a very nice lecture. So uh, you told about clomiphene citrate should never be combined with gonadotrophins. It doesn't help. Is it true with tamoxifen also? If you see the mechanism of action, then it is more or less the same. same. And that is why only letrozole, that is, is a very good combination. Okay. But don't use anestrozole. It is a hopeless drug. It yeah, does not give you yes, sir. any result. And uh, during your stimulations with IUIs, you start with gonadotrophins on day three or day five? Day five. Okay. From day five onwards? Day five onwards. Only GNS? Just a minute. E, no, I normally start either a highly purified FSH or I start with the recombinant FSH. Mm. I don't use HMG in my regular stimulating protocol that I use only for IVF patients, some of the IVF patients. And when the PSV is between 10 to 15, one conventional 36. That is enough, one 10 to 15. But what happens that many a times you have to decide the timing of your ultrasound and timing of your HCG. Many a times you do an ultrasound in the morning and you give HCG in the evening. So you should yes. anticipate what change is going to happen to the patient. Okay. Good morning, sir. Uh, sir, you mentioned about um, uh, um, Ishidara some uh, protocol for improving the low count, low sperm count. HMG and uh, HCG uh, should be given uh, once a week. Uh, what is the dose? I would like to know. 75 sir. international unit, thrice a week, at HMG or FSH. Okay. And HCG once a week. Uh, 5,000. 5,000. Minimum 13 weeks. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, it'll be good if you can introduce yourself before asking a question. Uh, that will be helpful for us uh, in maintaining some data. Uh, hello, sir. I am Dr. Nupur. I am uh, doing fellowship reproductive medicine for Millen Fertility Center. Sir, uh, I want to ask one question regarding the measurement of uh, subendometrial blood flow. Uh, sir, when we use a Doppler, sir, how much do you keep the PRF value? They are less than 0.3. Less than 0.3, sir. Both for sir, follicular as well as endometrial blood flow? Foot. Okay, sir. Thank you. Any more questions? Okay, the mics will be handed over to you if you have questions. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for hearing. Thank you very much, Dr. Nagori. We liked it we enjoyed it and i'm sure uh, it, it is very fruitful to a lot of us